you have this wonderful center here, the home for Bible translators. And I'm sure that the organizers and the leaders try to convince you that you should translate, because that's what you do, should translate uh, from the language uh, of the country. And uh, I agree to that. And I will come to this issue from another aspect, and I would say uh, one has to translate from the language of the Bible. And the Bible was written only in one language, and that's the Hebrew language, and some parts also in Aramaic. But things got to get more complicated for the area with which we deal, because there's also somewhat later Dead Sea Scrolls, there's medieval, so the early Dead Sea Scrolls and medieval uh, manuscript, and there's ancient translations, and all, all of these sources are very important, and somehow we are a little confused what do we have to use as a source for our translations and uh, it is true uh, some translations are even translated from English or from French and so we have to face these uh, issues so first a few words about uh, the inventory. What, what are the kind of texts that, uh, do, uh, that we have? There's no doubt uh, that the, the Bible was written in the same language we have it in front of us, in Hebrew, some parts in Aramaic. The script was different from what we have in front of us. Uh, prior to the present script, uh, there was the ancient Hebrew script. And before that, there was even a more ancient script. So the script that Moses could have seen was even more ancient than the ancient Hebrew script. It's something like Proto-Canaanite. Would we be able to understand Moses if he spoke? Someone said, maybe not. Um, would Moses understand us? I think, basically, I think that Moses would have understood us more or less, maybe half of what we say. And we, would, we definitely would have understood Moses because we read what is in Scripture. But now the texts. If you use your Bible in whatever language, these are more or less uh, translated from the text that we now call the Masoretic text. And the Masoretic text is the Hebrew, traditional Hebrew text, also called the received text, that is based on uh, ancient uh, traditions. But these ancient traditions are from the Middle Ages. And so we now know more, and we, uh, we in quotation marks, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, we can go back 1,000 years more, to more or less to the time of Jesus and 100 uh, years before, 200 years before, and that's the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The problem being that those Dead Sea Scrolls are uh, really fragmentary. You all look in the large Isaiah scroll and it's all very beautiful. I would not want you to translate the Bible today from that Isaiah scroll. It's a badly written scroll. It's a scroll with many mistakes, very uh, imprecise here and there. It's complete. The spelling is very strange. Those of you who know Hebrew will find a very strange word, but it's complete. And, and a, the story in the New Testament says that uh, Jesus, when he was in the Galil, he uh, opened the, an Isaiah scroll in the synagogue in my view, but no one can prove this, this would never have been anything like the Isaiah scroll found in Qumran, that is 1Q Isaiah A, not like 1Q Isaiah A, because don't quote me, and even though they uh, <laughs> record me here, don't quote me, I, th I think this is not a b an excellent scroll, but the other uh, Isaiah scroll, 1Q Isaiah B, is a, is a very good one. So that could have been used in the synagogue uh, in the Galil. 
So now let's make a little order. We have the, the, the biblical text that we hold in our hands today in modern edition, that's called the Masoretic text. That's more or less uh, the text that you hold in your hands in English or in French, etc. I say more or less because there are some real differences. These go back, or this edition goes back to the Middle Ages, to the medieval Masoretic Codices. They are not based, the modern uh, Hebrew editions are not based on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, that's two. The ancient uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, the medieval Masoretic uh, Codices. Then we have a very important uh, Greek translation, the so-called Septuagint. Why is it important? It's important because scholars say uh, that uh, this translation reflects, not contains, but reflects many important readings, many important details, and is often more original than the uh, Masoretic Hebrew Bible. But it's in Greek, and you're not going to translate a modern text into uh, into English from the Greek Bible. This is very little done, but it is also done. But the main texts are translated from the Hebrew. It was the text uh, that Jesus used, that Paul used. I, I think I could speak more uh, with certainty about Paul than about Jesus. This was the text that Paul used. And there are here and there, scholars who believe that that text should actually be translated into English and used by Christian communities. This is uh, an of-the-way view. Now, in, in addition to the Hebrew and the Greek, we have a host of ancient translations into ancient Syriac, the so-called Pshita, into Aramaic, the so-called Tagumim, and from around the year 400 into Latin by Jerome. All these versions need to be translated back into Hebrew before we scholars can use them in our reconstruction of the Hebrew Bible. Because basically, that's what scholars do. Scholars uh, and in particular scholars called textual critics like myself, want to find out not what the Hebrew text was like in the Middle Ages, they want to find out basically what was the original Hebrew text, and when doing so, they run into trouble. Because basically, we can never know what was the original Hebrew text, and I believe there is not this is a little complicated at an abstract level because I say there was no original Hebrew text. Sounds a little strange, but uh, the Hebrew text ran through a series of ancient, uh, authentic versions. So, but what scholars do, they try to find out what was the original text, uh, or something like it. And they set a set of rulings, or rules, in order to find out what was original. It's all subjective. And that's one of the key words in my talk. I do this the whole day, and every day. This is my, my bread, so to speak. Uh, I compare ancient readings, and uh, no one uh, knows better than me how subjective this is. That's to say, it's very difficult to be sure whether in a certain detail, and I will give you some examples in a while, whether in a certain detail uh, the Masoretic Hebrew text is better, more original, or whether the Septuagint translation is, is more original. And this is what I do. I give a yearly course on the Septuagint, and that's what we do during the whole year. We learn the Septuagint, and we compare. 
the, the most important sources basically are the Masoretic text, uh, some Dead Sea Scrolls, not all the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, like I just said, some maybe insulting words about the Isaiah Scroll, uh, some Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Septuagint, the Masoretic text, and the other translations are less important because they're very close to the Masoretic text. That's the Vulgate, the Aramaic Targumim, the Pshita, are very close to the Masoretic text. So what we do in our scholarly work, we learn, we read, and we compare. And I, I'll give you some examples as on your handout. The first example is in English and not like the next one in Hebrew. I thought, what is a good example to show you in English without any knowledge of the source languages? Now, the, uh, uh, the giant of the Philistines, Goliath, is described in this way in 1 Samuel 17.4. A champion of the Philistine forces stepped forward. His name was Goliath of God, and he was six cubits and a span tall. Of Ho Shesh Amot Vizeret. That's very tall. Um, it's definitely more, uh, let me see, a, a cubit. This is a cubit. So it's more than a foot. So it would be three and, and a three meter maybe and a quarter or so. So that's even in the basketball uh, field, you don't see those people. This is very tall. But now you go to the uh, Fork Samuel A, a very important uh, ancient scroll, and many good and ancient readings. And this agrees with the Greek translation, the Septuagint. And here the same man is lower, four cubits and a span. I think we have no criteria in order to find out uh, which is the original reading. Because, first of all, we're not talking about an error here. Some people, in some of the, uh, no, most of the modern translations, uh, they will say, we follow the Masoretic text unless there's an error in the Masoretic text. Okay, that by itself is a difficult principle. But here we're not talking about an error that are about from two or three re very respected sources. And in one he is three meter and the other one he's two meter. Was it, and, but there's a logic. I mean, or the, you can imagine your own logic, because these basically, and that's one of my principles, these manuscripts develop in a linear way. Not like this, but in a linear way. That means that maybe the first reading was six cubits, and someone said, no, that's too much. Uh, no one will believe this story. Let's make it four. Okay, that's one possibility. The other possibility, and someone said, well, it was four cubits, and then someone said, no, no, we want them really to believe that David was a strong man, and he was able to kill someone who's a real giant. So then it developed from four to six. I say we have no ways of uh, making sure which is the original meaning. You can decide I mean, there are commentaries, and they say this, and they say that, but there's no real way of knowing. Another example, closer to your home, Genesis 2.2. We all know this verse. When did God complete the work that he had been doing? On the seventh day? If that would be true, he would be sinning, God himself would be sinning a little bit according to the Jewish law. It's easy to play with the English language, but it was written in Hebrew. 
It's easy to play in the English language to say, by the seventh day, then everything is okay. <laughs> but that's not written. So Rashi has this explanation, a Jewish uh, medieval uh, interpreter has this explanation. God entered the Shabbat like a hair breadth, just like a millimeter. It's very difficult, but I believe even this slightly difficult reading is probably the original reading. But there's another reading. God completed his work on the sixth day. That's much more logical. So maybe at the end of the sixth day he completed his reading. But here too, I could say, well, it's actually mainly one reason. Uh, I could say, well, the main reading is that God finished his work on the seventh day and someone said, well, that's a theological issue. That's a theological problem. We cannot ascribe this to God. Let's change it to the sixth day. And in very respected sources, uh, we have God doing, finishing his work on the sixth day. That's on the Septuagint and in the, in the Pshita and basically I've not written, the, yeah, in the, written this down here and in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now, most of your translators, translations will have God finishing on the seventh day. But look here, I quoted here the REB, Revised English Bible, and this is a modern translation in Great Britain they have God finishing his work on the sixth day so you might say if all the people in, in England follow the RAB translation and the people in the rest of the world they follow uh, the other translation, so some say the sixth, some say the seventh. Basically what I say, you have a, it's, you might say it's a small thing, but it, it is still, for people who live with a translated Bible, it still is an issue. When did God finish his work? And so you, you have this problem to which basically there is no answer. How many such cases we have, I don't know how many such difficult cases. But uh, the, the last example is a famous uh, quote from the first chapter uh, of uh, Samuel, Ach Yakem Adonai Edvaro. And we have here in the, in the um, may the Lord fulfill his word. So the Lord will fulfill his word with regard to the vow of Hana. Or, completely different, uh, may the Lord fulfill that which comes out of your mouth, of Hannah. It's very interesting because this is two different ways of viewing the situation with regard to the young Samuel. Um, did the Lord promise something that has to be uh, fulfilled? Or did uh, Hannah have a certain vow and that needs to be fulfilled? I can imagine how one reading, oh yes, and Aaron just wrote about this, right? He wrote about just uh, a few months ago, he wrote a paper on this uh, in uh, JBL. I can imagine how uh, one could change one reading to the other one, or the other one to the first reading. It's very difficult to make up your mind here. So basically, if I go back to my points, I talk so far uh, on points one to four, and then I, I now come to point five. What is the task of modern translators? Um, this will be um, formulated, phrased in different ways by different communities, by different translator uh, bodies. Um, I would say, 
as far as I know, most of the translators, uh, they basically take the freedom in their hands. And they do what I beforehand quoted, like follow the Masoretic text, but change it here and there if you think the Masoretic text is wrong. Uh, this is an official guideline that I see in introductions to translations. The result is a lack of order. I mean, the word mess is a big word and maybe not so very honorary, honorary not so honorific. Um, but basically, this is what you have, because I, I, I gave this example from the REB. When did God finish his work? On the sixth day or on the seventh day? So if you follow this Bible, you read this, you follow that Bible, you read that. There are no uh, handbooks, except for a few, that will tell you uh, which reading to follow for translators. And the ones that I know, the handbooks, uh, like I, I know one that I read in detail, uh, that's the one by Omanson on Esther. Um, even they give you some freedom. Or if you, you can't even follow the Biblia Hebraica because that leaves certain freedom too. So basically the translator is left on his own and, and the poor translator, who may not be an expert in, in textual criticism, will have to decide himself or herself. So that's why I developed this view, and I wrote a paper on this more in detail in a, a journal called Textus in 2000, and it's also included in my um, Collected Writings, Volume 2, and I developed a view uh, against eclecticism, that is against the choice of readings uh, by translators because I say uh, translators do not have the knowledge, intuition, know-how in order to make a choice between these various options uh, because scholars themselves don't know uh, how to make a decision. So how can we expect from translators to make this decision if the scholars don't know? So my suggestion has been to follow one source. It's a good source, that's the Masoretic text. On the whole, I would say it's the best source. Um, but also the Masoretic text has some problems, and then maybe uh, you have to overcome them uh, with solutions uh, on the spot. Like in the examples that I give in number seven, seven, yes, I give some examples of real difficulties in the Masoretic text, and maybe you have to be creative. Cain said to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, etc. Well, that's the text. What did he say to Abel? We don't know. But that's the text of the Masoretic Bible. So the uh, Jewish Publication Society Bible have this solution, as you see here in English. Cain said to his brother Abel, dot, dot, dot. And maybe that's the best you can do. So this is an example of a problem in the Masoretic text for which you have to be creative. Oh, how about this verse? Ben shana Shaul b'molcho v'shte shani malach al Yisrael. Literally, I can see no other possibility than Saul was one year old when he began to reign and he reigned two years over Israel. Very strange. Would he have been one year old? That's the text. Maybe a number fell out, maybe he was 21 years old, maybe 31 years old, as in the ancient versions. Again, the uh, JPS trans, no, the NRSV 
has a very inventive, uh, creative solution. So was Dotto Doji is old, <laughs> etc. These are official translations and I'm behind this. These are the minority cases. So I would say in very difficult ca cases, be creative, but otherwise I suggest to follow the Hebrew Masoretic text. Thank you so much.